Good morning, I'm Sarah Gannam, filling in for Taylor Wilson. Today is Friday, March 29th, 2024. This is The Excerpt. Today, former President Donald Trump makes another attempt to get charges of election interference in Georgia tossed. Plus, a USA Today exclusive about what's next for the cleanup of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried is given a lengthy prison sentence for stealing billions from customers. Former President Donald Trump's lawyers were back in court in Georgia yesterday, arguing that Trump should not be prosecuted for trying to steal the 2020 election. For more on what happened, I spoke with USA Today Justice Department correspondent Bart Jansen. Bart, thanks so much for joining the excerpt. Thanks for having me. What happened? What did Trump's lawyers argue yesterday? Trump's lawyer was trying to throw out the charges based largely on the argument that Every time that he's accused of doing something, that basically he was saying something or conveying a message, and his lawyers were saying, well, he was talking about politics and the management of elections. That should be the highest level of protected speech under the First Amendment. And so how could you possibly charge somebody for just exercising their right to free speech? And how did prosecutors respond? Well, they said even if the stuff was true that he was saying, that you could still charge him because he was effectively coordinating or directing criminal activity by others, which is why the overall charges in the case are a conspiracy. Um, The allegations are that 19 people got together and through various illegal activities conspired to try to steal the 2020 election. Four of those people have already pleaded guilty. The other 15, including Trump, have pleaded not guilty. So the prosecutors say it doesn't even matter if it's true. It's that he was coordinating people and communicating with them and that they were conspiring together. Now, the prosecutors go a step further and say most of what he was saying was lies. He was alleging widespread election fraud that state and federal officials investigated and found no evidence of widespread fraud. Of course, his lawyers uh, say that even if he was lying, You still have to protect that speech. They don't really concede that he was lying, but even if he was, you have to allow people to be wrong in political debate. Trump has tried this First Amendment argument before in trying to get a similar case in Washington, D.C. dismissed. Is there a chance he could get a different result in Georgia? Well, there's absolutely a chance that he could because it's a different judge and it's a different jurisdiction and it's uh, state level charges instead of federal charges. But in the federal case, which is also largely the same allegations, U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin has already reviewed this argument. She did an exhaustive study of whether he should be shielded from the charges because of the First Amendment, and she ruled that he should not. But Fulton County Superior Judge Scott McAfee is a different judge. He's shown himself to be a pretty thoughtful guy, and so he could potentially reach a different decision, but he didn't sound like he was agreeing uh, with Trump. He said, that those are facts that the jury should weigh and should be decided at trial. He did not issue a decision from the bench, and he sounded skeptical of the First Amendment argument. What's next for this case? They'll be debating these pretrial motions for at least weeks and maybe months yet before any trial starts. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis has requested a start for the trial August 5th, but Judge McAfee has not yet ruled on that request or or set any date, but he continues to iron out these disputes about what issues can be debated, how issues will be debated before the trial. So there's a lot more pre-trial work to do on this before we get to the full trial. And Bart, where does this case fall in terms of the calendar compared to the other three criminal cases that Trump has pending? The race is on to try to get any of these trials completed with verdicts before the November election. The best chance looks like New York, then perhaps the federal case in Washington, D.C. on election interference. And Georgia, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis would like hers to be in that mix with an August start, but that has not been assigned yet. Thank you so much, Bart. I really appreciate your info and your context, all of your reporting. Thanks for having me. 
The wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore and the grounded cargo ship that crashed into it early Tuesday is presenting a deadly hazard to divers who are trying to clear the channel and search for missing bodies. This comes from the commander of the Army Corps of Engineers in an interview exclusive to USA Today. Lieutenant General Scott Spellman told USA Today Pentagon correspondent Tom Vandenbroek that this is a very complex and challenging operation. The pre-dawn bridge collapse killed six construction workers, but as of early this morning, only two bodies have been recovered from the site. The fatal event resulted in about 3,600 feet of steel bridge supports plunging into the channel. Some of that structure remains draped over the grounded cargo ship that caused the collapse. Lieutenant General Spellman said rescuers have to go down approximately five stories where there is no sunlight to do their recovery work, maneuvering around razor-sharp broken metal that could be deadly. Spellman said that one of the largest cranes in the country is now headed to the site to help move the 4,000 tons of metal. But to do that, the Army Corps of Engineers will have to cut the metal into at least four sections. They'll then have to remove the concrete and mangled reinforcing bars that have sunk to the bottom of the channel. Spellman said that all of the debris will need to be removed to make sure the channel remains clear for transit. And the process can't even start until the analysis of how to accomplish all of this safely is complete, something that could take several more days. Meanwhile, Secretary Pete Buttigieg announced last night that the first $60 million in federal funds to support Maryland's rebuilding effort have been approved. You can follow the latest developments at usatoday.com. Last night, a star-studded group of commanders-in-chief were out to help shore up support for President Joe Biden's re-election campaign. As the current Democratic presidential nominee looks to unite the party, former Presidents Obama and Clinton co-headlined a high-dollar fundraiser at New York's Radio City Music Hall. More than 5,000 supporters attended the sold-out event, making it the most lucrative fundraiser so far this election cycle. USA Today White House correspondent Joey Garrison joins the excerpt to shed light on what the event did for President Biden's campaign. Joey, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me on. Tell us what made this event so unusual. Well, so a few things. So last night, President Biden's campaign raised $25 million or or more. We're still waiting for a final tally, which if you ask the campaign, that makes it the most lucrative fundraising event in the, really in the history of politics. So first and foremost, it raised a ton of money for the Biden campaign, which has already outraised Donald Trump so far. Secondly, it's just very rare that you have three presidents all together in this way. Uh, obviously, you have Biden supported by two of the previous Democratic presidents, Obama, Clinton. That in itself isn't unusual, but Ironically, if you look at Donald Trump, he doesn't enjoy that same luxury. Of course, he's alienated himself for much of kind of the old Republican guard, including former President George W. Bush. $25 million is a lot of money. But beyond that, what did this event mean for the Democratic Party? Biden is still trying to shore up support among all the factions within the party. And so right now, Biden has been struggling in polls head to head with Donald Trump. And the main reason for that is he is underperforming with some of the key constituencies who vote, tend to vote Democratic. Those include black voters. He's underperforming there as well as Latino voters, young voters, uh, the progressive wing of the party. And so to have Obama, who still is the most popular figure in the Democratic Party to be out there shows a unified front that's signaling a message to Democrats whether or not Biden might not be the person they wanted to see there to get on board. And the message we heard from Biden, as well as the former presidents, Obama and Clinton, were all the same. And that's the urgency to beat Trump. And they're all unified with that message that Trump presents what they say is a real threat to this country. There has been some speculation over the last few years that the relationship between Obama and Biden has frayed a little bit. Mm-hmm. Were you surprised to see them come together for this? No, not at all. And, you know, I think anything 
uh, the speculated on that might be a little overblown. I, I think the biggest difficulty for, for Biden is Biden is still kind of operating in the shadow of Obama. Of course, Biden, who had been in politics for decades, really didn't see his rise to the, the stage that we see him now. It's only the result of Obama picking him as his vice president. And, you know, he stood with two presidents and Obama and Clinton who've really kind of created their own legacies for themselves, whereas Biden is still kind of trying to figure out, I think, what his legacy is going to be. Obama campaigned vigorously for Biden uh, in the 2020 campaign. And Obama is, first of all, quite alarmed by the possibility of Trump uh, getting into the White House again. And I think the way Trump followed him into the White House in 2016, that's something that I think has always upset uh, Obama. I think the real concern that Obama has that Trump could actually win this, you know, means that Obama is going to be there campaigning for Biden every step of the way for the next seven, eight months until the November election. Joey Garrison is a White House correspondent for USA Today. Joey, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me on. FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried was sentenced to 25 years in prison yesterday for stealing $8 billion from customers. It's the end of a dramatic downfall for the former billionaire Wonderkind. A U.S. district judge rejected Bankman-Fried's claim that the customers of the now bankrupt cryptocurrency exchange did not actually lose any money, accusing him of lying during his trial testimony. The disgraced crypto boss was found guilty in November of seven fraud and conspiracy counts stemming from FTX's 2022 collapse in what prosecutors have called one of the biggest financial frauds in U.S. history. Bankman Freed said in a statement to the judge that FTX customers have suffered, and he apologized to his former colleagues. At the same time, he also vowed to appeal his conviction and his sentence. Fast food workers in California are losing their jobs as restaurant chains there are preparing to meet a new $20 minimum wage set to go into effect on April 1st. The restaurants making cuts are mostly pizzerias, according to a report published by The Wall Street Journal, which said that multiple businesses will be laying off hundreds of workers while also cutting back hours for those who remain. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed the landmark legislation last September, forcing food chains with 60 or more locations nationwide to increase wages. After the bill was signed, Pizza Hut announced the slashing of more than 1,200 delivery jobs, and Excalibur Pizza says it will cut 21 percent of its workforce. Chipotle's CFO told Yahoo Finance that the company will be forced to increase prices to comply. And before we go, today marks the one-year anniversary of the arrest and imprisonment of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovitz by Russian authorities. USA Today recognizes the incredible value that reporters like Evan bring to our understanding of complex topics around the world. Journalism is not a crime. We at USA Today stand with Evan and call for his immediate release. To show your support, The Wall Street Journal has a list of things that you can do. There's a link in today's show notes. Thanks, as always, for listening to The Excerpt. You can get the podcast wherever you get your audio. And if you're on a smart speaker, just ask for The Excerpt. We are produced by Shannon Ray Green and Bradley Glansrock. Our executive producer is Laura Beatty. I'm Sarah Gannam, filling in for Taylor Wilson, who will be back tomorrow with more of the excerpt from USA Today.